My name's Joellen Riley. Um, my present position is as Dean of Sydney Law School at the University of Sydney. I've been teaching uh, law for about, oh, since 1998. And I also am the Professor of Labor Law at the University. And do you wish to um, make a statement? Do you know, I'm thinking that some of your questions that were sent through earlier mm. were so very interesting. Um, I'd be very happy to let you question me, particularly as um, I do come from the oldest law school, the most traditional one by reputation at least, and I often wonder whether people um, have so many uh, preconceived notions of what it's like at Sydney that perhaps it'd be best if I just open myself to questioning. <laughs> okay. Um the university is considered to be one of the sandstone universities which carries connotations of um, uh, 19th century. Um, I'm sure the university is not in the 19th century as well and truly in the 21st century. Um, perhaps if you could uh, give us an outline of what the university is doing to adapt its courses to take account of the changes that are taking place within the legal profession. Right. Um, look, first of all, uh, you'd probably be well aware that all students coming into a law program at Sydney are either coming into a combined LLB program with another discipline that's melded together for the first three or four years and then they complete law, or they come into the JD program, the graduate program. Um, and so we see our curriculum challenges as, as university-wide. Uh, the university is presently engaged in a new education strategy that's particularly focusing on um, ensuring that students going through their degrees do advance into more advanced learning the further they go through their programs, uh, more project-based work, more work that pulls together the various disciplines that they've studied in um, sort of cross-disciplinary projects, uh, more mobility experiences. I've just seen statistics over the weekend that 36% of our students in the in the LLB um, program and the JD program have an overseas experience that we facilitate for them either by exchange or because we have a number of offshore schools. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that we're particularly uh, have been developing. More opportunities for experiential learning, learning um, to apply what they're learning in the classroom in more theoretical policy-based, doctrinal-based courses in uh, activities-based courses. Uh, well, I'll ask the $64 question. Where does responsibility lie for the integration of graduates into the legal workforce? Is it the universities? Is it those who um, provide PLT courses? Is it the, their, um, their future employers? Um, look, I think responsibility is shared. This is, a, this is a partnership arrangement. I think it's... Um, you used the term preparing graduates to hit the ground running when you were um, interrogating my colleague. And, and that particular expression brought out the labour lawyer in me. Mm. I have a deep conviction that the hitting the ground running depends entirely on what ground you're hitting. And the, the employers will have some responsibility in uh, the sort of the on the ground training and development um, integrating their graduates into whatever it is that they want to do. And I'm particularly mindful of this because I know that for as long as I've been at the university, even as a student, graduates at Sydney at least do go in many different directions. They, they do go into the New South Welsh legal profession, they do aspire to the bar, that's certainly the case, but they also go into business and industry, media, government, they go overseas. Um, alumni at the moment, um, setting up schools in Africa and doing work in, you know, Cambodian um, sort of justice systems. So to some extent, we at the university um, can't direct things towards what job someone is going to have because we don't know what that job will be and we certainly don't know what that job will be in four years, five years, ten years. Our job is to prepare them with the kinds of adaptable skills that will fit them to keep learning and to um, approach employment. So 
I think that those who do go into the profession, I note where it's the New South Wales Law Society that we're talking um, about here, sure, the PLT <coughs> program is going to be important for getting some of those basic uh, skills. I did the College of Law course myself years ago. Even the College of Law course can't actually prepare you for that first day in court being grilled by a cranky judge. Uh, a lot of that happens on the ground through experience and with good coaching and mentoring from the firms, the places that you work with. So I think it's a shared responsibility. Um, technology is um, all consuming at the moment for the legal profession. Is that something that the universities should be focusing on as part of un their undergraduate courses? For example, um, should law graduates come out of university with some coding skills? Uh, it would be good if universities, if students came out with some coding skills, but I don't think it's part of the law degree program. And at Sydney, we've introduced what's called the open learning environment that will be launched um, in 2018 uh, of short courses in generic skills that are valuable to all graduates. And the idea is that students um, who are convinced that coding skills is a useful thing can do those particular courses. Um, now, the, the, the thing we have to remember is that the three-year full-time uh, study in law has so much law to put in it. There are all sorts of other valuable skills that a graduate lawyer could benefit from, but they're not going to be taught in the law curriculum as such. They'll be taught in other parts of the curriculum and the extracurricular activities. Languages, for instance, yep. very important. You can do a diploma of languages at the University of Sydney as a kind of an extracurricular add-on. We're not going to stop teaching contract and property to fit those things into the law curriculum because that would be abrogating our responsibilities to the profession to actually train the lawyer side of the graduate. Um, Professor Riley, I, I'm an in-house lawyer mm -hmm. and I often find that the young lawyers that come to me, or young in the sense of five years out, can't read a balance sheet, can't read a profit and loss statement and in the role that I have I need them to have some mm -hmm. business skills so I often find that I need to find that for them and building on what Gary asked you about learning technology in your degree, do you think there is scope for law students to learn more about business in general in their degrees? Oh, I, I personally do. I came to law a little bit late as a finance journalist um, and a lot of our graduates are in fact commerce law graduates and they probably go more to the side of finance. So I, I am happy to agree wholeheartedly with the proposition that all those kinds of skills are very important. Uh, again, um, we would encourage students to do those, to learn those kinds of things uh, extracurricularly or even um, to focus on those kinds of issues when they're reading their cases. I'm in my handbag at the moment. I have a a resulting trust case that involves a bankruptcy situation and there's all sorts of balance sheet and financial issues in that. We'd encourage our students as they're learning the law to pay attention to the detail of the fact scenarios and to pick up the information they need and to do further in investigation for that reason. Uh, I guess the question that um, I'd like to ask is we currently have the Priestley 11 that sets out the sort of the core courses that need to be offered by a law school. Um, is that still fit for purpose, considering where the legal profession is going, or is that something that needs some, um, some change? Look, that's a very interesting question. I think the thing about the, the Priestley 11, which is sort of quite long in the tooth now, is that it, it focuses on sort of topics and content, and I personally think that all of those topics and content are still very important. You do need to understand contract and tort. You do need to understand you know, procedural law, the rules of evidence and those kinds of things. What the Priestley 11 sort of didn't really focus on perhaps because of the, the time at which it was put together is the way the skills, the legal skills uh, develop. And I think one of the reasons why we've had such um, attention recently uh, on whether statutory interpretation should be put into the Priestley 11. I think what, what the question really is, is that should um, 
a skills-based approach be recognised in the Priestley 11, rather than treating statutory interpretation as yet another set of content-based knowledges. Uh, it's about how you uh, use primary sources to understand what the law is and to solve problems and come up with solutions. And so I think that a revision of the Priestley 11 to focus on the skills that uh, students are getting out of their studies is an important thing. Um, but I, I would say that it, it would be very difficult to go through the list of the things that are on the Priestley 11 and say, oh, strike that off, we don't need that anymore. I think actually, in fact, some of us on staff were rather horrified when uh, we saw a proposal that corporate law be lost from the Priestley 11. Now, Claire, I, I think you'd disagree with, <laughs> disagree with that as well. And, and not only because so many people go into corporate and commercial practice, but also because understanding the very nature and essence of those legal persons who make up a greater number of legal persons than there are individuals in our community and how they're governed uh, is very important for anyone understanding our society and how it operates, whether you're doing social justice work or or you're worrying about the, you know, the, the balance sheets of BHP. So I'm, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't pair away the content of the Priestley 11, but I would um, favour a review that looks at the kinds of skills that we're looking at developing. Do universities, does your university um, look at um, uh, how lawyers might um, practise in 15, 20 years' time? And what's the process for um, undertaking that, um, I guess, uh, crystal ball gazing right, within the university? Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm always wary of crystal ball gazing because I remember when I started out as a journalist 30 years ago, we were looking at the information superhighway just coming and, and optic fibre was just invented and everyone was saying, oh, you know, with all robotics, we're all going to be working 25-hour weeks in the future. No one's going to need to work so hard because technology will do it all for us. And that I've seen out, that it? it hasn't worked. My little daughter, who's now just started at a, a major law firm, works much longer hours as a six-month-out graduate than I did 20 years ago when I was a graduate at Mallison's mm -hmm. alongside my colleague here. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think sometimes the danger is in trying to imagine what the future will be and prepare for that future um, I think the better thing is to understand that we always need to learn to adapt uh, and, to, and to develop those the kinds of skills that my, my colleague mentioned, you know, that deconstructing um, logic, uh, critical thinking, learning, reading, absorbing information, um, listening, uh, you know, collaborating, those are the kinds of skills that we need to be fostering in our students so that they'll be prepared for any kind of future because I think um, they will need to use their skills very creatively as, as technology changes the way legal services are delivered. We're already seeing that, aren't we? We're already seeing, um, you know, websites where you can plug in your basic data and come up with a preliminary view of, you know, what your best negotiating position is uh, in you know family law and those kinds of things. I think those kinds of skills will will develop, and uh, our students need to be able to do the kind of thinking that helps them develop those tools, not just use those tools, but create those tools. How do we compare with um, overseas tertiary institutions in in terms of developing? Um, skills for our, our graduates. Uh, are we ahead of the game? Are we behind the game? And, and do you actually focus on what's happening look, uh, on overseas as well? We, we look abroad, but in fact, I'm, I'm still convinced that an Australian legal education is a premier legal education. Uh, you may, um, you'd be aware that our law degree does in fact provide the knowledge base for admission to practice. So we actually have much more, a, a, a deeper and broader focus on the law curriculum in our programs than say um, in the US or in the UK. You can actually study law 
do, do less law to get a law degree in those places, but then you have to do bar exams to, um, to actually go into practice. Uh, so I think we actually do have quite a, a strong curriculum here. Um, and I think we've also, um, for such a long time, focused on this multidisciplinary approach, the idea that you don't just go straight into law and just be a lawyer, but you combine it with other disciplines is something also that has been a strength of the Australian approach to legal education. Uh, and it's why our best graduates are off to London and, and New York to work. They've, they're highly regarded employees in those jurisdictions because they have such a good legal education from us. I was going to ask another question, yeah. if I may. Do you worry with the increases in technology or the advances in technology and the Googleization of law, if I can call it that, do you worry that the law students are going to find it even more difficult in the future to get jobs as lawyers? Um, do I worry that they'll have difficulty getting jobs as lawyers? Um, look, I, I read, you know, with some consternation, the regular articles about you know, there's too many, the overproduction of lawyers. I hate that expression because I sort of see our our young people and our, our graduates not as, as a product, a factor in production to go into some kind of engine room. Um, they are citizens and that they will make their own way in the world with, with the education they get. Um, I... I think they do face a challenging time because I think there is changes in what kind of work graduates are expected to do. I don't think graduates are needed to do two years worth of discovery work anymore and thank goodness for that. Um, but they will be going into interesting kinds of jobs and they need to be adaptable. Um, so uh, do I worry? I. I, I worry no more than anyone worries at any point in history about the fact that there always seems to be a threat of under um, a lack of employment opportunities. You have to remember that I came out of university in 1980 uh, and couldn't get a job as a school teacher, and that's how I ended up doing other things because there was no jobs. Um, with that personal experience um, and knowing that. You, if, you're, if you've been educated well to adapt, you can take the opportunities that present themselves. And I do think that someone with a combined law degree is uh, as well equipped as anyone to take opportunities as they arise. Yeah, just one other question. Um, so you, you, you touched on the sort of the interdisciplinary approach mm. that comes with doing the sort of the, the combined degree. Mm. Um, I was just wondering, in the law degree itself, um, what opportunities are there for sort of interdisciplinary exposure or learning, you know, working with people from other parts of the university or people who are in practice from other areas than law? Uh, well, look, in our, our programs, we have a few uh, extracurricular types of activities like the um, there's the exoneration uh, project at the moment that's working with students in social work and psychology. Um, so there are some of those kinds of activities that are uh, developed. Um, in our elective program, um, a number of the areas that we've sort of got specialty areas in tend to focus on the aspects of law that link with other areas. So there's environmental law programs and we have the Institute for um, the Australian Centre for uh, Environment and Climate Change Law and the uh, scholars in our faculty work with scientists and geographers um, and put together their programs with those kinds of connections in mind and have a number of sort of combined speeches and things. Uh, the international lawyers work, you know, with yeah. history and philosophy. Um, so I suppose the, the, um, the elective curriculum is informed by the disciplines that connect with those particular areas. Our refugee lawyers work with people in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences as a new centre for migration, law and policy. 
So those are the kinds of connections that are sort of built in, mainly in, in the elective program, more so than in the, in the Priestley 11 compulsory program.